Madre Teresa de Calcutá nunca mentiu sobre suas intenções. Ela nunca afirmou que lutava para aliviar o sofrimento do pobre ou eliminar a pobreza. Madre Teresa sempre afirmou que a pobreza era uma dádiva divina, que o sofrimento e as doenças eram necessárias para a salvação da alma e que o pobre teria que aceitar resignadamente sua condição miserável e o sofrimento pelo qual passava. Na cidade de Calcutá, a casa dos moribundos é um lugar sombrio. As condições de higiene são precárias. Os doentes são entulhados em macas uma ao lado da outra. Não podem receber visitas de parentes ou amigos. Não podem ser levados a hospitais. São submetidos a banhos frios. São obrigados a ficar constantemente deitados ou sentados em suas macas. E voluntárias sem nenhum treinamento médico utilizam seringas não descartáveis sem antes esterilizá-las e administram apenas analgésicos para todo tipo de doença. An American doctor told me that she had been trying to treat this boy and that he had a really relatively simple kidney complaint that had simply got worse and worse and worse because he hadn't had antibiotics and he actually needed an operation. And she was so angry and she said, well, they won't take him to hospital. And I said, why? All you have to do is get a cab, take him to the nearest hospital, demand that he has treatment, get him an operation. She said, they don't do it. And I thought, but this kid's 15. A casa dos moribundos, como o próprio nome diz, não é um lugar de recuperação de doentes. É um lugar para a morte, mesmo para aqueles com enfermidades facilmente sanáveis. E você deve estar pensando que toda essa negligência e maus tratos resultam da falta de recursos financeiros da instituição. Mas isto não é verdade. Repórteres da BBC que acompanharam Madre Teresa acreditam que ela recebeu durante suas viagens pelo mundo mais de 500 milhões de dólares em donativos. Grande parte desse dinheiro foi parar nos cofres do Vaticano e outra parte foi destinada à construção de mais de 500 conventos em vários países. Now we are in 105 countries and we have 500 convents all around the world without counting India. <laughs> Beautiful. Todo esse dinheiro arrecadado por Madre Teresa possibilitaria a construção e o gerenciamento de vários hospitais e clínicas médicas com pessoal bem treinado, medicamentos e condições de higiene. No entanto, Madre Teresa utilizou essa fortuna para construir conventos e instituições religiosas. I don't think that's what people thought they were giving the money for. It was the building of religious institutions to hire and train an order of completely obedient, uneducated nuns. Hoje em dia, 15 anos após a morte de Madre Teresa, não encontramos nenhum tipo de melhoria em suas instituições de ajuda aos pobres. E é difícil acreditar que se trata de uma instituição multimilionária. Do you know how much money you have in the missionaries and charity? Countless. Countless. <laughs>Muitos que a conheceram pessoalmente a descrevem como uma pessoa cruel e desumana, pouco interessada em realmente ajudar os pobres e muito interessada em infligir sofrimentos desnecessários e glorificar a morte. Todos os esforços de Madre Teresa eram direcionados à preservação da pobreza e do sofrimento. Ela nada fez pelos pobres embora tivesse todas as condições financeiras para fazê-lo. It was an individualistic kind of effort that makes no difference to society as a whole. It doesn't provide people with jobs, with food, with a shelter, with education. And those are the things that we need here.
over this unhappy globe, there are heroic volunteers putting up a selfless battle on behalf of the wretched of the earth. But only one of these is considered to have invisible means of support, to be nothing less than a saint. What makes Teresa of Calcutta so divine? Mother Teresa's helicopter touched down at about 20 past 11 this morning. The crowds were gathering here at Knock. Among all of you who have made this pilgrimage to Knock this afternoon, we are privileged to have with us as a special guest at this Mass a pilgrim who has come from afar, a woman whose worldwide symbol for goodness and holiness. We Not many claims made by the Irish clergy are widely or uncritically accepted, even in Ireland. But the saintliness of an Albanian nun named Agnes Boyacu is a proposition that's accepted by many who are not even believers. Mother Teresa herself receives extravagant adulation as no more than her due. Of all the women in recent history, no one has captured the public imagination like Teresa of Calcutta. I'm not being facetious, and I'm certainly making no comparison when I say that no woman has made such an impact here since Our Lady herself appeared in 1879. So how did this auction of hyperbole and credulity get started? In that year of grace, 1969, the scrupulously neutral and objective British Broadcasting Corporation permitted that old fraud and mountebank Malcolm Muggeridge to pay a devotional visit to the Calcutta Shrine. I'll just say, when after I met you in London, really the only thing I wanted to do is to come and see you in your work here. Now I've seen it. And of course it's a, it's a shining light. Himself arrogant, almost to the point of humility, Muggeridge became persuaded that he and his team had become the divinely appointed instruments of what he claimed was the first television miracle. During uh, Something Beautiful from God, we, there was an episode where we um, were taken to uh, a building that Mother Teresa called the House of the Dying. And Peter Schaefer, the director, said, uh, well, we, it's very dark in here. Do you think we can get anything? And we had just taken delivery at the BBC of some new film made by Kodak, which we hadn't had time to test before we left, so I said to Peter, well, let's have a go. So we shot it. And when we got back, several weeks later, a month or two later, we're sitting in the, in the Rushy Theatre at Eden Studios, and eventually up came the shots of the House of the Dying. And it was surprising. You could see every detail. And I said, that's amazing, that's extraordinary. And I was going to go on to say, you know, three cheers for Kodak. I didn't get a chance to say that, though, because Malcolm, sitting in the front row, spun round and said, It's divine light. It's Mother Teresa. You'll find that it's divine light, old boy. And three or four days later, I found I was being phoned by journalists from London newspapers who were saying things like, We hear you've just come back from India with Malcolm Mugridge, and you were the witness of a miracle. <laughs> and a star was born. This profane marriage between tawdry media hype and medieval superstition gave birth to an icon which few have since had the poor taste to question. It's like uh, you're, you're actually seeing a living saint. Give a man a reputation as an early riser, said Mark Twain, and that man can sleep till noon. How does the reputation of Holy Mother Teresa look if, just for a moment, we switch off Malcolm Muggeridge's kindly light? Mother Teresa is a Nobel Prize winner. She's a symbol. People in the West talk about her. So Indians adopt her at that level. The fact that what she does in the streets of Calcutta is really irrelevant to them. They couldn't care about it. And most of them don't even know. But Mother Teresa is the sort of figure you show to visitors. Mother Teresa's flagship institution 
is her home for the dying, a hospice which purportedly sweetens the last moments of otherwise destitute lives. My initial impression was of all the photographs and footage I've ever seen of Belson and places like that because all the patients had shaved heads. There are no chairs anywhere, they're just these stretcher beds and they're like First World War stretcher beds. There's no garden, no yard even, no nothing. And I thought, what is this? This is a this is two rooms with fifty to sixty men in one, fifty to sixty women in another. They're dying. They're not being given a great deal of medical care. They're not being given painkillers really beyond aspirin and maybe if you're lucky some brufen or something for them for the sort of pain that goes with terminal cancer and and the things that they were dying of. And I thought, what's the point? Right from the very beginning, I wanted to serve the poor purely for the love of God and to give them what the rich people get with money. I wanted to give to the poor for the love of God. They didn't have enough drips. Um, the needles they used and reused over and over and over, and you would see some of the nuns um, rinsing needles in, under the cold water tap. And I asked one of them why she was doing it. And she said, well, to clean it. And I said, yes, but why are you not sterilizing it? Why are you not boiling um, water and sterilizing your needles? She says, there's no point. There's no time. Mother Teresa's cult of death and suffering depends for its effect on the most vulnerable and helpless, abandoned babies, say, or the terminally ill, who supply the occasions for charity and the raw material for demonstrations of compassion. The first day I was there when I'd finished working in the um, women's ward, I went and waited on the edge of the men's ward for my boyfriend, uh, who was looking after a boy of 15 who was dying. And an American doctor told me that she had been trying to treat this boy and that he had a really relatively simple kidney complaint that had simply got worse and worse and worse because he hadn't had antibiotics and he actually needed an operation. I don't recall what the problem was. She did tell me. And she was so angry, but also very resigned, which so many people become in that situation. She said, well, they won't take him to hospital. And I said, why? All you have to do is get a cab, take him to the nearest hospital, demand that he has treatment, get him an operation. She said, they don't do it. They won't do it if they do it for one, they do it for everybody. And I thought, but this kid's 15. I ventured on my own pilgrimage to the Missionaries of Charity in Calcutta in early 1980. Who could fail to be touched by the work of the orphanage? Not I. Though I did find myself a little put off by the mission's motto, He that loveth correction, loveth knowledge. Bit of a workhouse ring to that, perhaps. But it was Mother Teresa herself who completed the wreckage of the effect. As we stood by the tiny cots, she turned and said, This is how we fight abortion and contraception in Calcutta. Now, it might be argued that a campaign against family planning is low on the list of Calcutta's many pressing needs. But as a leading member of the Pope's fundamentalist tendency on matters of sex and procreation, Mother Teresa has made this single issue into her global crusade. The greatest destroyer of peace today is the cry of the innocent, unborn child. If a mother can murder her own child in her own womb, what is left for you and for me to kill each other? Tenderness about the unborn is an emotion that I share myself. But tenderness about the unborn also becomes an overtly political matter when it's preached by a presumable virgin who also campaigns against birth control. Let us promise our lady who loves Ireland so much that we will never allow in this country a single abortion. And no contraceptives. 
Mother Teresa has no politics, so she maintains, and so many people believe. But when she came to London in 1988, ostensibly as an advocate for the homeless, she bent the ear of the Iron Lady and sought to steer her to the support of a bill limiting abortion. The sponsors of that bill, who arranged the meeting, were in no doubt that her intervention was political. She's not a party political figure, but she's a political figure in the sense that, A, she is part of what may be called the uh, Catholic agenda, the Christian, broader Christian right agenda, and the Catholic Church has been following what has generally been considered a hard line approach under the uh, present uh, Pope. And, and now, she's part of that agenda, and that is fairly political agenda. I mean, you know, uh, no abortion, uh, opposition to birth control, ideas like that are, are fairly, uh, you could say, they, are, they, they would be contested in the political arena. And the second factor is that she's also part, if you like, of the Western agenda, where the West is still part of the third world. The rich world has a poor conscience. It wants, in fact it needs, to think that someone, somewhere, is doing something about the third world. And the Mother Teresa myth ministers to this desire. Here is a Western woman who has forsaken her life, albeit whatever life she might have had in Albania, um, you know, for, for sacrifice herself for the people of the third world. It makes the West feel better, you know. This is, this is one of us again, once again, rescuing the third world. Raising the world. Yes, raising the world. He's got his rations. Yes, so. he's got it, he's cleaning it. Mm -hmm. And then pay to shop. In the subliminal appeal that she generates, there is something of the mission to the heathen, something of the old colonial outpost, and something of Florence Nightingale. While in the silent and abject demeanor of her patients, there is something of the deserving poor. The great white hope in this iconography takes on the big black hole. And the rewards are by no means all in heaven.